أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد ديفيو السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to another episode where we are discussing the most beautiful story in the Holy Quran the best of stories with the best of narrators. Allah narrates the story directly to the Holy Prophet. It is the story of the Prophet Yusuf, peace be upon him. Before we continue where we left off, I'd like to remind us that in this holy month of Ramadan, God has gifted us with the gift of fasting. There are people who aren't healthy enough to fast. There are youngsters who are not able to fast. For those of us who are healthy and are able to undertake the fast, let us remind ourselves how blessed we are. When the Holy Prophet went to Mi'raj and he spoke directly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah asks him and he says, O oh Ahmad, do you know when a servant is most closest to me? At what time, during what action is a servant most closest to me? The Prophet says, no. So Allah replies and he says, O oh Ahmad, at two times. The first is when he's in sajda. That's a time when there's hardly any hujub, any veils between a servant and his beloved master Allah. And the second time is when a servant is hungry. When a servant is hungry, he has not satiated his desires. Allah says he's closest to me at that time. And that is why when we fast, we become more conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We think about him more. We don't commit the same sins we would do outside of fasting as we do whilst we're fasting. It's one of the blessings of fasting that as we refrain ourselves from that which is halal, not even that which is haram, when we refrain ourselves from that which is halal, Allah gives us that much more ability and tawfiq to gain that much more proximity to Him. Of course, there's a famous tradition from the great lady Fatima alayhi salam in which she says, how many of people who are fasting don't have anything but hunger and thirst? This should remind us that this fast is not only for us to abstain from food and water, but this fast is there in order for us to abstain from all ills that we commit. We should refrain and hold and take the reins of our eyes so that we're in control of them and where they fall, of our ears and what they lean to, of our tongue and when it moves, of our feet and where it takes us, of our hands and what it touches. This is when somebody has truly fasted. A level above this is now when an individual takes control of their own thoughts and begins to ensure that they take the reins and control of their thoughts such that they do not allow their thoughts to move and wander from here to there, thinking about and contemplating about wrong and evil or things that have no benefit to them. You know very well how merciful this Lord is, that when we think about wrong, He doesn't punish us for it, neither is it written down. But when we even contemplate good and intend it, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala writes it down for us, as if we have completed that action. On the Day of Judgment, we're told, that a time will come when the servant will stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his book of good deeds will be given in his right hand and the book of, left, of, of evil deeds will be given in the left and then another book will be revealed to him and came, come to him and in that book when he opens it he shall see actions which he knows he never did for example he, it's written inside that he's built a mosque or he's alleviated poverty from the whole world he knows he wasn't able to do these things so he turns around to Allah and he says to Allah, I swear by your might and your glory that you know very well that I didn't do these actions. So Allah turns to him and says, No way to muha fakatabnaha. You simply intended these actions, so we've written them down for you. That's how merciful this Lord is for us. And in this holy month of Ramadan, when we perform these actions which he loves the most, we should remind ourselves of the merciful Lord that he is. Not of the wrathful Lord, not of the punishments of Allah. That's one aspect that should be recounted and we should remind ourselves of. But the greater characteristic of Allah is not one who punishes. He starts this holy book by saying, 
Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful. He uses his names of Ar Rahman and Ar Rahim. Throughout the story of Yusuf, you and I find how merciful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to his beloved servant. That he never lets go of a servant. If a servant thinks that all doors are shut, then he has misunderstood God. Because there is one door that never shuts. That is the door of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a female mystic who says, how long will you knock at the door that is already open? You don't knock at the door of Allah, you just enter. You want from Allah, you raise your hands and you ask. And you should be 100% certain that he's going to answer. Never think for a moment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lets go of an individual. Never think for a moment that Allah doesn't pay attention to you and I. Never lose hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at how he looked after Yusuf. Even after what happened to him in the well. Look at how his plan unfolds and he takes gentle care of Yusuf. We're at that part in the chapter where the brothers of Yusuf have now thrown him into a well. وَجَاءَتْ سَيَّارَةٌ and then a group of people come by, a caravan of people come by, an individual goes forth and throws down the bucket in order to fetch water. As he picks up the water bucket, expecting just water to be filled within, he finds that Yusuf comes up. قَالَ يَا بُشْرَ هَذَا غُلَامٌ So he turns around and he says, good news, we have a young child over here, we have a servant, we can go and sell him for some money. Just think about what this individual has said. When you and I come across a young child who has lost his path or lost his way, the first thing that comes to our mind is how can we assist this young child to get back home? It again reminds you and I, Have you not seen an individual whose base desires have overtaken him? Everything he looks at, he looks at how to make benefit and profit from it. He wants to see how I can take from it, not how I can give back. When he sees people in need, he doesn't think, how can I give? He thinks, how can I exploit? When a war happens in Iraq, for example, a war happens in Afghanistan, people like that, they don't think, how can we help the people of Iraq or Afghanistan, of Yemen? Instead, they think, how can we benefit? How can we exploit? How can we increase the prices of medicine? How can we increase the prices of construction so that we can benefit and reap more from these people and their governments? These are individuals who have been taken by their desires. All they see is the dunya which they're running after. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised that the dunya will never be given to these people. I want to give you an example. We see it in this story of Yusuf. And I mentioned it previously in another episode. That they wanted the love of their father. They were already given his love, but they wanted his undivided attention. But they didn't get that because they went about it in the wrong way. They went about it by separating Yusuf from Yaqub in a manner in which God was not pleased. They could have asked their father to give them more attention. Their father could have explained why he was doing what he was doing. But instead of that, they decided to take this path against Allah. So Allah deceived them in their own plan. I want to give you an example of people in our society today who are extremely wealthy. If you've ever read the biography of an individual who's become very wealthy, there are a few things that you see are quite common between this clique of people and this strata of individuals. The first is that their goal from the onset is to become the wealthiest of people. They want wealth, that's their aim, that's their goal, and they won't stop at anything for that. A time comes when they have to make a decision between family and wealth. Many of them have had problems in their marriages. Many of them have cut off relations with their children and their children don't speak to them because they come to a crossroads. Some of them don't even get a relation, don't even have a relationship, don't even get married, don't even have a companion because they're too engrossed in this dunya and trying to make and match their goal. You find a time comes where they have to make a decision at a crossroads between their work, the dunya, their goal, and their children, and their family, and their spouse. Many of them, many of them choose their work life. And when they do that, they forego everything else that God has blessed them with. And this individual works hard and works very hard. And because of the time and effort they put in, they accumulate and amass a great deal of wealth. But think to yourself, the most wealthiest individuals, what's the common factor between them? What do they always do when they become extremely wealthy? Well, they do one particular thing. They give away the wealth that they ran after. Can you imagine running after something for 50, 60 years only to finally achieve it and obtain it 
and then only to think to yourself that there's no satisfaction in it. Satisfaction is in now in giving away that thing which I was running after. That thing that I gave my family up for. That thing that I gave my health up for. Now I'm going to give it away in order to find satisfaction. You find some of the most wealthiest people have even made it public knowledge that they're not going to give their wealth to their children. Instead, they're only going to give, leave behind a very short, small amount of money, but the rest of it is going to charity. Why? Because they don't want to spoil their children and they don't want their children to become like them. They don't want their children to have a masses of wealth only to find out that there is no satisfaction and no life in running after this dunya. As the caravan comes to this well, they bring out Yusuf. They do not have any level of humanity left within them. They see this child and they ask themselves, how can we profit? Let's go ahead and sell them. But this is the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unfolding. As they take him to the marketplace, the king, an advisor, comes by. And as he comes by with his wife, he tells his wife, it seems that they didn't have children, the Aziz and his wife Zuleikha. They come by and they see Yusuf, this young child, extremely handsome. They say, let's take him either as a child or we'll take him as a servant. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions here, وَكَذَلِكَ مَكَّنَّا لِيُوسُفَ فِي الْأَرْضِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this was our plan. This is how we're going to establish Yusuf in the earth. This is how we're going to make him a king of the, the head of the treasury in the lands. Yes, you saw from your naked eyes that he was in difficulty in the well. But we looked after him and we revealed unto him such that he was calm and collective. You thought that he was being kidnapped and what was happening to him was evil. Externally it was evil and wrong. But internally it was good for him and there was a plan that was unfolding. And now when he is bought as a slave and he's taken to the king's palace, you think he's going to be just a slave. You think that he's going to be mistreated. But we have a plan that is unfolding behind the scenes. Why? Because at the end of the day, the best of planners is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever he desires, his plan will come to fruition. Whatever he desires to be executed, shall be executed. I want to remind ourselves here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control of absolutely everything. If you've ever tried to plant seeds in the ground, you will see that some grow and some don't. Everything happens by His permission. The seed that grows only grows by His permission. The seed that doesn't grow, doesn't grow by His permission. And that is why, especially in Muharram, when we recount this verse, when we recount this statement of Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam, it begins to make sense when we realize that everything is in the hands of Allah. When Yazid asks her, how have you found what Allah has done to your brother? What does she remark? And she says in that famous off-repeated line, she says, وَمَا رَأَيْتُ إِلَّا جَمِيلًا I haven't seen anything but beauty. Do you think that everything that happened in Karbala happened without the permission of Allah? It happened with His permission. It was under His eyesight. It was under His vision. He was watching over Hussein. And everything that happened to Hussein only happened because Allah wanted it to happen to Hussein. Why? Because with every arrow that hit his chest, he was going to a station that nobody else would have been able to achieve. He had to endure that difficulty and hardship. Externally, it was difficulty and hardship. But internally, Hussein was ecstatic because he was achieving a position that nobody else could have achieved. In the same way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran with regards to something we see on a daily life, but something that goes past our eyesight because it's so evident. Allah questions and He says, Have you not seen the birds in the sky who expand their wings and contract? Ma yumsikuhunna. What's holding them up? Is it that He just says in the verse, He says that they are expanding and contracting their wings. And then He asks the question, What is holding them up? Do you think it's the expansion of their wings and them contracting their wings that is holding them up? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا يُمْسِكُهُنَّ إِلَّا الرَّحْمَانِ Nothing is holding them up apart from the All-Merciful. If you and I want to stand up sometimes, don't you find that you have a dead leg and you can't stand up? It's a reminder that however strong you think you are, without the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're not able to even stand up. And that's why we say in the Salah continuously when we pray, بِحَوْلِ اللَّهِ وَقُوَّتِهِ أَقُومُ وَأَقْعُدُ it's only through His power and permission that I stand up and I sit down. As these nights of Ramadan are ending and they're coming to a close, we must remember that we should use our time to the best way possible, in the most beneficial manner possible. 
So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that these nights of Shah Ramadan do not let them end but that you have forgiven us for our sins. Allah, if we've wronged an individual who we cannot find, an individual who may not forgive us, inspire them to forgive us. Allah, if we've wronged you, if we've done wrong against you, if we've missed our prayers, if we haven't paid our dues, if we haven't fasted a fast that we should have done, if we haven't gone for Hajj when we should have gone for Hajj, Allah, forgive us our sins and give us the ability and tawfiq to repay you in, a due co in, in the manner in which you deserve. With that I end and I greet you. Wassalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.